Welcome to the 30th meeting in 2023 of the Delegated Powers and Law Reform Committee. We have received apologies from Mercedes Vialba this morning. Before we move to the first item on the agenda, I would like to remind everyone present to please switch their mobile phones and other electronic devices to silent. The first item of business is to decide whether to take items 5 and 6 in private. Is the committee content to these items in private? Moving to agenda item number two, and today we are taking evidence on the regulation of legal services Scotland Bill from Siobhan Brown, MSP, the Minister for Victims and Community Safety. The Minister is accompanied by two Scottish Government officials, Jamie Vilhelm, who is the Legal Services Regulation Reform Manager from the Justice Directorate, and Leanna McClarty, who is a solicitor from the Legal Directorate. So, good morning to you all. I can remind that all attendees to not worry about the turning on the microphones during the session because the broadcasting will be dealing with that. So we'll move to the, the, the session, but before we do, I'd like to invite the Minister to make any opening remarks. Minister. Good morning, Convener, and good morning, Committee members. I welcome this opportunity to make a brief opening statement about the regulation of Legal Services Scotland Bill 2023. As set out in the Delegated Powers Memorandum, the overarching policy objective of this bill is to provide a modern, forward-looking legal services regulatory framework for Scotland that will promote competition, innovation and the public and consumer interest in an efficient, effective and independent legal sector. The bill seeks to implement a number of key recommendations from the Independent Review of Legal Services Regulation in Scotland by Esther Roberton. The Roberton Report. That report's primary recommendation of a single independent regulator resulted largely in polarised views from those in the legal and the consumer landscape. <clears throat> Despite this, there were many areas where there was broad agreement between the stakeholders, including a common aspiration for any future model to be transparent, open to public scrutiny and efficient to assure that justice remains accessible to all. The bill is designed to take a proportionate approach that seeks to balance and deliver the key priorities of all stakeholders. With each and every bill, and as this committee will know, the Scottish Government always considers very carefully the rationale for the inclusion of delegated powers. For example, to provide flexibility and to be able to react and be responsive to future events without having to resort to amending primary legislation. The bill therefore seeks to take a proportionate approach with regards to what is provided for on the face of the bill and what is provided for by the way of delegated powers. That said, I accept that there are certain delegated powers within this bill that have caused concern amongst some stakeholders. Therefore, and reflecting carefully on the discussions we have had with stakeholders, including the senior judiciary, it is my intention to bring forward amendments at stage two intended to address concerns raised in respect of the role placed on Scottish ministers within the bill. I recently wrote to the Equalities, Human Rights and Civil Justice Committee on the 27th of September to inform the League Committee of my intentions and I provided further information on the 27th of October. Finally, convener, I would like to reiterate that the Scottish Government has committed to continue to work collaboratively with stakeholders in respect of these reforms and throughout the pas a parliamentary passage of this bill. Thank you, Convener. Happy to take any questions. Uh, thank you very much for that, Minister. Uh, Minister, Section 5 of the Bill gives the Scottish Ministers the power to allow them to modify the regulatory objectives and uh, professional principles of, uh, sorry, for legal services set out in Sections 2 to 4 of the Bill. And the Committee heard evidence from both the Law Society and also the Faculty of Advocates uh, that their views uh, in this is that the provision should be removed from the Bill. Uh, the reason, uh, reasons for calling for its removal included that it is, in their opinion, unforeseeable as to why or when the objectives and principles uh, would require to be modified. And if that was necessary, uh, such objectives and principles are too important to be modified by <coughs> secondary legislation. What is, uh, what your, is your consideration and thoughts about the, about the, the ob observations? Uh, that this committee has held, and can you give the committee any examples of when it may be necessary 
to modify the objectives and the principles. Yes, thank you, Convener. We recognise the importance and commit to maintaining the regulatory objectives and the professional principles. In order to strengthen the safeguards here, we intend to introduce amendments which could, would require the Lord President's consent to be gained before any changes may be made to regulatory objectives or professional principles or how they apply. We are also considering amendments which would limit the scope on how any such changes may be sought by limiting this to be done by the request of certain bodies like the regulators and the consumer panel. The regulation making power is an important mechanism to future-proof the regulatory framework in recognition of the fact that the regulatory best practice may change over time. Since the introduction of the regulatory objectives and professional principles within the Legal Services Scotland Act 2010, it has become apparent that they can be strengthened by the inclusion of consumer principles and better regulation principles as recommended by Esther Robertson. The Scottish Government also views the human rights panel principles as an important addition. In the next 10 year period, it may be apparent that further refinement, refinement may be required and therefore the bill allows for such flexibility. It may be possible that the consumer principles or the better regulation principles will be updated in the next decade and we would wish the bill to respond to any such changes. This also shows in the eight years between the first introduction of into legislation and Esther Robertson's report, there was an up, a need to update them. Okay, no, thank you for that, Minister. And so, with uh, those potential amendments, uh, will have your officials or yourself actually had any further dialogue with uh, the, the faculty and the law society uh, in preparation to bring these amendments forward? We, yes, we have been having conversations, but I'll bring in my officials. The conversations are ongoing. Jamie, did you want to come in? Sure. So, throughout the development of this bill, um, the Scottish Government has committed to working in collaboration with all stakeholders. Uh, we continue to engage um, in the development of amendments, and, and we will do so during the passage of the, the bill's passage through the Scottish Parliament, um, as we are altering the delivery of certain provisions so that they move from ministers to the Lord President. Our discussions in the main have been predominantly taking place with Lord President's office. Um, as those dis the, the, the discussions advance, we will be able to engage further with wider stakeholders, such as the Law Society and the Faculty, and, and, uh, and um, indeed uh, the, the, the other key stakeholders. You know, thank you. Um, we're going to move on to Section 85, uh, which is the regulatory categories. And that section 85 gives the power to the Scottish Ministers, which uh, would enable them to reassign legal regulators between Category 1 and Category 2 regulators, which uh, would change the requirements that uh, a legal services regulator is currently subject to. And the Law Society suggests that this power uh, should be subject to a statutory duty uh, to report on the outcome of the consultation and that the Lord President's consent should be required. The Faculty of Advocates does not agree that there should be a power to reassign regulators from one category to another through regulations. Uh, so how, would, uh, how do you respond to those uh, differing uh, considerations, Minister? And is the Scottish Government planning to make any uh, amendments or, or uh, considering to remove this particular power? Thank you, Convener. The bill uh, seeks to take a risk-based and proportionate approach. The categorisation of the regulator has implica implications in respect of the operation of its regulatory functions. For example, a Category 1 regulator must delegate its regulatory functions to an independent regulatory committee and establish a client protection fund, whereas Category, category 2 regulators would not have such duties. It is considered important for the bill to have a mechanism to alter the category of an existing or new regulator should there be a significant change on how a regulator meets the relevant criteria at section 86. In order to strengthen the safeguards here, we intend to introduce amendments which would require the Lord President's consent to be gained before any changes be, be made to the regulatory category of a regulator. We're also considering amendments which would limit the scope on how such changes 
may be sought by limiting this to be done by the request of certain bodies, such as like the regulators or the consumer panel. In addition, there may be scope for a new regulator to enter the market which may require consideration of its categorisation or a change to that categorisation in respect of changing circumstances. If I could just give one example, convener, the Association of um, Construction Attorneys only has uh, six people in it, so we don't feel it would be uh, appropriate for them to be Category 1 and all the duties that are put on Category 1 as, as of cat Category 2. Okay, no, thank you, Minister. Jeremy um, Balfour with a supplementary. Uh, good morning, Minister, and to your officials. I, I just wonder on a, that general point of giving this power to um, the Lord President, there did seem to be some concern, both from the Law Society and from the Faculty of Advocates, of the role of the Lord President in this. And I'm just wondering, in your conversations with um, stakeholders, is there a concern within even the judiciary that we are given power to the Lord President, which could be seen as having to make him or her make political decisions, which clearly is not what the Lord President is there to do. And had we been concerned raised that it is inappropriate for the Lord President to be doing this type of um, work? Thank you, Convener. Um... Yes, I, I don't think that there has been ongoing uh, engagement with both stakeholders and the legal sector. Um, I might bring in Jamie, if I can, just to give an update on that. Of course. Uh, the judiciary's uh, response to the lead committee for the call for views highlighted the oversight that the role of the Lord President uh, plays in, in, in the framework. It's considered important that there's a check and balance when making such changes for the Lord President to have that uh, 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 kind of a uh, role. Um, Lord's con con the Lord President's consent is intended to act as a veto, um, and if that consent is not achieved, uh, the measures or steps being considered uh, would not be progressed further. Um, where consent is required, that is required before regulations are laid in Parliament, which means Parliament make the ultimate decision on whether the regulations would be passed into law. Uh, the, the, the requirement for the Lord President's consent already exists in legislation. In, in relation to uh, alternative business structures in the Legal Services uh, Act 2010, um, and the Lord President gave consent to the authorisation of Law Society of Scotland as an authorised uh, regulator of licensed license legal services providers. I just wonder, with the extension of these powers, is the Lord President um, judicially happy with them? Well, uh, engagement uh, is continuing um, in respect of these provisions, um, and uh, we, we, hope, we hope to reach a, 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 a consensus as to the way forward. Again, just to appreciate you, Minister, the, 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 the feeling I'm getting from my answer is they're not happy with it at the moment and want further negotiations around that. Is, is that a fair summary of... I wouldn't think that's fair. I think early neg negotiations are ongoing regarding this, and as, as as we move forward, we will be taking forward and considering all the recommendations of this committee and the League Committee as well, and and also the legal sector. But the uh, engagement is ongoing regarding this. Thank you, Camille. Uh, yeah, thank you, um, Oliver Mundell. Thank you, Convener uh, and Morning Minister. I'm, I'm deeply uh, concerned, actually, by, by the kind of start to this morning's session. I had hoped, uh, off the evidence we'd heard last week, that you'd be in a kind of better position to, to tell us the, the way forward, uh, because I, I, I do I share concerns about what is a, a kind of big change uh, to the Lord President's role, um, and I want to kind of understand, you know, what, what you know, you're, you're clearly there's clearly an uncomfortableness about these provisions uh, in the faculty, in the law society, and you know there's 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 clearly ongoing discussions to put it in its most positive uh, sense with with the Lord President. So what what would what would prevent this happening if the power was actually in the bill? What would prevent these kind of negotiations and kind of strong arming happening to get agreement? to changes to the to the principles or changes to, to regulations? Convener, I, I have to ingre, um, disagree with Mr Mundell. There's no uh, 
people feeling uncomfortable here. I've been listening as before the bill was introduced, and hence my reasoning with officials to be engaging with both sectors, stakeholders, and the judiciary in how we move forward um, with this bill and bringing a balance to the issues that have been raised thus far. The Scottish Government is considering the options for amendments and reflecting the views of stakeholders, including the senior judiciary, and with the intention of building a consensus regarding this around all this reform. While we, whilst we have indicated an intention to make amendments, we are working on their development and we're aware of the importance, as I said previously, of the stage one parliamentary process in drawing out all stakeholders' views and of the committee's consideration. We have had constructive engagement with the senior judiciary and their officials to build consensus around the best approach to the detailed provisions. And the plan changes to the bill will take time to work through. However, I will provide the committee as we go through the different sections on what our proposals are at the moment. Okay. Thank you. Alderman Minister, I mean, I don't want to be, be you know, confrontational, but it appears you're doubling down on the same strategy of, of making the Lord President's consent central to these provisions. And last week, you know, we heard from, you know, the, the two biggest, uh, you know, legal stakeholders out with the judiciary, that they were deeply uncomfortable with that, that it was, you know, in effect, undermining confidence in the rule of law, uh, that it... That the powers were, were were too broad, and they were pretty serious concerns. They weren't. They were saying that they would. There are things that would embarrass Scotland elsewhere around the world. You know that there were concerns from the Commonwealth uh, Lawyers Group. You know that it wasn't kind of just just light concerns they had. Um, you know, and, and you've kind of come today to tell us you, you're just continuing with that approach and adding in a few sort of. What I would consider quite minor safeguards. Okay, if I could, it just if, makes me it just makes me concerned that that the government doesn't really understand the strength of feeling there is in the legal profession. Okay, a convener, if I could just um, maybe just to bring in some context of how things are done in England and Wales in what we're proposing as well. In England and Wales, the Legal Services Board acts as an independent regulator on the front line regulators of solicitors barristers and other branches of the legal pro profession in England and Wales. The LSB is accountable to the Parliament through the Lord Chancellor and is sponsored by the Ministry of Justice. The Lord Chancellor, a UK minister, has a number of statutory roles in reg regulation to the Legal Services Board and the regulation of legal services within Legal Services Act. 2007 and some of these are very similar to things that have been proposed in this bill so i just wanted to offer clarification there i have been listening to the committee's views from last but week and also officials have been engaging with the judiciary and stakeholders that, that offers me a uh, zero reassurance i mean I, I i'm very proud of the scottish legal system you know of our unique traditions and you know i, I don't think aiming uh, you know, aiming to, to model our legal system on what happens uh, in England and Wales is, is, is the approach we should be we, but, but, we should be taking when we've got a very different with all uh, due respect, you know, we've Mr. got a very different and distinct system. And I'm I'm sad, you know, to hear that yeah. uh, you know, from a Scottish government minister. And furthermore, um, you know, I would be in favour, um, and I've spoken out in relation to Scottish law officers in uh, politicians having less. Uh, of a direct role, um, uh, uh, you know, in terms of, in terms of, uh, the, the, what their involvement in the legal profession. So I don't, I don't really think pointing to to the situation with the UK government is helpful um, in that regard. But specifically, um, on section twenty six, um, which confers a power on Scottish ministers to make regulations specifying other measures uh, they may make in relation to a legal regulator, following a review. Of the regulatory performance. Measures already set out on the face of the bill include setting performance targets, imposing financial penalties, and changing or removing some or all of the regulators' regulatory functions. Last week, stakeholders told us they were fundamentally opposed to this provision and have called for its deletion. Is this something that there would be any movement on? A clarification it's at section 20, subsection 6. Section 20, not 26. Right, okay, yeah. sorry. So, uh, thank you, um, convener. Section 20, uh, 
six in brackets, is intended to be used, should it be discovered in practice, that further additional measures would be helpful tools because of the existing suite of powers in section 20 are found to be insufficiently robust or extreme or disproportionately severe. The powers ensure appropriate tools to tackle any poor performance on part of regulators. This section is also intended to be used to give further details around the specifics of the measures which can be taken and the procedures involved. For example, it allows Scottish ministers to specify the maximum amount of financial penalty which may be imposed on a regulator in accordance with paragraph 13 of the Schedule 2 of the Bill. This power has already been written into legislation and approved by Parliament within the Legal Services Scotland Act 2010. I have indicated my intention to introduce amendments which will transfer, transfer the responsibility for carrying out the review under sections 19 and 20 to the Lord President. This regulation makes powers remain necessary despite the change, but the provision already requires the Lord President's agreement before any regulations are made. That power acts as a veto against any new measures being introduced. And if I could give you an example of where this delegated power could be used, whilst we consider the measures already provided are, are sufficient, it may be that the Lord President would seek a power to remove a particular individual from the role within a regulator, rather than take measures against the regulator as a whole. In certain circumstances, the Lord President may remove the chair of the SLCC, just as an example. Okay. Thank you. Um, Oliver? Yeah, I'll, I'll just leave it there, convener. Okay, thank you. Uh, Jeremy Balfour. Yeah, uh, thank you, convener. Uh, again, we took evidence last week um, from faculty and the Law Society, and what became clear was particularly the Law Society seemed fundamentally opposed to the provisions in Section 35, uh, which would allow Scottish ministers to make replacement regulatory arrangements in circumstances where a, regula a regulator has or is likely to cease operating. I wonder again, could you address those concerns and do you think it is appropriate, the appropriateness of acting for subordinate legislation in an urgent situation rather than simply bringing primary legislation forward to the Parliament? Thank you. Thanks, Convener. It, it's considered that these newer regula regulators run the greatest risk of encountering circumstances which render them unable to operate on short notice and create a need for Scottish ministers to step in and ensure that their members continue to be authorised to provide legal services to the public while alternative arrangements are worked out. It was considered appropriate to separate these provisions from Section 49, which also deals with situations of necessity in relation to any regulator allowing the Scottish ministers to take action as a measure of the last resort, but maintaining the requirement for parliamentary scrutiny and approval in advance of such steps. However, given the similarity of the measures between Section 35 and 49, we are exploring amendments which would bring them together in one provision, which would maintain the power to take action in urgent situations, but transfer it, take it away from the Scottish Ministers and transfer it to the Lord President. <coughs> and in regard to that, um, how would that be done? Would that uh, do you foresee that being happening through regulation or on the face of the bill? If I could bring in... Uh, <coughs> the, the provisions on the face of the bill would require to be amended to make clear um, where the power to take this action lies. And then, but we do consider that the regulation-making power is still necessary to give effect to any exercise of the power that the Lord President might... You, when the Lord President might seek to use it, it would still require uh, power to make regulations. So the Parliament then would have no involvement in regard to that? Well, there would still be a regulation-making power. So the, the, these, these are still... How it would operate and the details of how it would operate are still being explored. Um, amendments would be required to make clear to the provisions in the Bill where the ability to use this power lies, but the regulation-making power would still be required if the power is exercised to give effect to the changes being sought. Uh, okay, I'm slightly confused. So would the regulation power be
be brought forward as this bill progresses, or would there need to be, if there was that decision made, would there have to be a regulation laid before Parliament to allow, at that time, specific time, to allow the Lord President to act upon that? Yes, as far as that's the current thinking. But like I said, the details of how it would operate um, are, are still being worked out, but that is the current thinking. Because in, in that case, and I suppose that comes back to the final point of my question, I mean, obviously, regulations have a lot less scrutiny by Parliament, and also we, we either have to say yes or no, there's no amending of them. So if that was required, why would it be done by regulation rather than bringing primary legislation through an emergency basis, which we have seen can be done within two or three days? If, if, I, just, if I may just come in, I think, um, Mr Balfour, as, as the officials have said, we are still working through the detail of that, and of course we will give careful consideration to the rec recommendations from this committee and from the lead committee moving forward. Yeah, but I'm still not quite sure why primary legislation can't be used. Um, to give so uh, section 35 in particular applies directly to accredited regulators which are any new regulators which would enter the legal sector through the bill um, and but the only regulator that exists at the moment which is equivalent to which came in through the system in the 1990 act which these provisions restate is the Association of Construction Attorneys, and, the, and they, they are a body which exists with six people at the moment, and they have an existing regulatory scheme, and it was considered that in such a case it would be possible to use regulations to ensure the continual operation of, of a very small body with a regulatory scheme that, that already exists. Um, it was considered that that was possible to be done by way of regulations rather than requiring emergency legislation in the case of a body that was that was so small. Okay. Um, if I can move us on, then, Minister, to Section 41, Subsection 2, which enables Scottish ministers to specify other regulatory matters which must be dealt with, dealt with within the rules. Again, in the evidence we took a uh, couple of weeks ago from the Law Society, they said this was a very broad power and that it is an unwarranted extension of ministerial powers into the authorisation rules and practice rules for legal businesses. The Law Society said that no amendment would make this power acceptable in real view. So in that view, are you still wanting to keep subse Section 41, Subsection 2 in? The power in section 41.2 gives the Scottish Ministers flexibility to expand upon the regulatory matters which will be covered by the regulatory rules, for example, to add clarity or to address unforeseen um, issues. For example, currently this will only apply to the Law Society as the only character, Category 1 regulator, but if in the future there were more than one Category 1 regulators or, and different regulators applied rules inconsistently, so it would have a negative effect on consumers or competition. It may be beneficial to make regulations so that there was a consistent approach by regulators. We've listened to the concerns and do intend to bring forward amendments which will narrow the scope so a change would be in a response to a request of bodies such as the regulators or the consumer panel and which introduce the requirement for the Lord President's consent and consultation with regulators regulators and the other bodies in respect of regulations under the section 41.2 that you mentioned. So just to be absolutely clear, you're seeking to amend, but you want to keep section yes. 41, subsection 2 in some form. Yes. And you don't accept that this is an overreach of politicians into the legal world? No, we do not. Okay. Um, finally, for me, convener, if I can, um, Section 41, subsection 6, contains a power for the Scottish Ministers to make regulations to allow Category 1 regulators to extend the scope of their ALB rules to capture other services provided by the business that they regulate, which is in addition to legal services. The Law Society, again, has questioned what other services the Scottish Government is thinking about and could be used to extend to cover, not already covered by legal services, 
as to find him a bill. It is suggested it may allow ministers to change the definition of legal services by the back door. I wonder what is your response to that? Thank you. Um, Section 41.6 has been criticised by the Law Society as preventing them from regulating legal businesses in terms of non-legal services, for example, estate agents, accountants or tax advisors. This is not the intention of the bill and we're working with the Law Society to ensure that the introduction of entity regulation is as effective and beneficial as possible and currently we are exploring amendments which will make that clear. Thank you. Okay, uh, thank you. Uh, and Bill Kidd. Uh, thank you uh, very much, Convener. Um, Minister, uh, can I just ask a question on reconciling different rules, please? Um, section 46, um, subsection 3, allows Scottish ministers to make regulations um, making further provision about reconciling regulatory conflicts with a requirement to make the Lord President's consent before doing so. So we're allowed that they we're, we're aware, big upon, we're aware that this, the Law Society has questioned the need for this section. Uh, could you expand on your explanation as to why the Scottish Government requires this power and how foreseeable you consider it is that the power will actually be utilised? Thank you, Mr Kidd. Uh, the general approach is that is for, it is for the approved regulators to resolve regulatory conflict in discussion with, as appropriate with other regulators. However, should this prove to be impossible or unduly complicated, this power allows the Scottish ministers the flexibility to ensure that such conflicts can be resolved. As the provisions to be made will depend on the detailed circumstances of any particular conflict which may arise and address an issue which is likely to require quick resolution, subordinate legislation is considered appropriate. As was raised with the Law Society during their evidence, they are already sub subject to the oversight of a number of regulatory bodies, for example, the Financial Conduct Authority for the purposes of anti-money laundering and incidental financial business. The bill also seeks to expand the oversight of the Scottish Legals Complaint Commission to allow them to set minimum standards for the first time. The bill also introduces regulation of legal entities for the first time in Scotland, and we've also a system for the regulation of licensed providers, which it is hoped will be up, running, um, up and running soon. The Law Society will continue to be responsible for the regulation of individual legal practitioners and for some firms operate across the border with regulatory responsibilities in each area of their operation. And as it has been acknowledged, this is a complex system and the delegation making powers provide, provides a reassurance that any regulatory conflicts which may arrive, arise can be rectified. Okay, um, that's quite comprehensive, but can I just ask... Um, are you still in talks uh, with the Law Society over this because of the questions that they have raised? Yes, uh, ongoing with all, all stakeholders and all the legal sector. So it's still being brought up? Okay. Yes. Well, thank you very much for that. Um, could I just ask then about, following on from that, uh, powers uh, under Section 49.1, powers of the Scottish Ministers to intervene? Um, <clears throat> because Section 49 provides that the Scottish Ministers may establish by regulations a body with a view to it becoming a Category 1 regulator and specify circumstances under which Scottish ministers may directly authorise and regulate legal business. Now, the Bill states that ministers must obtain the consent of the Lord President before making such regulations and even then only make them if they believe it necessary as a last resort. Now, again, stakeholders have called for the removal of this provision, asserting that it interferes with the rule of law and threatens the independence of the legal profession, which is quite a serious issue. So what are your reflections on these assertions? And is the Scottish Government considering removing this provision? And if not, is it considering making some other amendment to the provision? Thank you. The provision is intended to ensure that there is always an appropriate regulator in place to regulate authorised legal businesses should there be no other suitable regulator. 
This intervention may be necessary as the members of the regulatory may be involved in an ongoing court case that might be disrupted or because of transactions that might put them into difficulty. To avoid this and to respond to it, the Scottish ministers may intervene to create a body to become a new regulator or have another regulator, like the Law Society, step in to take over the regulation of even regulate the providers themselves. Where this power could be used, this provision is intended as a measure of a last resort in specific circumstances and only in the event where a regulator finds itself unable to operate. This is designed uh, as a measure, if a last resort, to cover situations where a regulator of an authorised legal business gets into difficulty. And this may be um, a financial collapse or it may be a result of regulatory failures. Moving forward with section 49, as I did um, mention as we were discussing section 35 previously, given the similarity of the measures of section 35, we are exploring amendments which will bring them together in one provision, which would maintain the power to take action in urgent situations, but transfer the, the, the power to the Lord President. And you're, um, once again, you'll still be in consultation with the Law Society and so on yes, over absolutely. this because of what you've just said there, actually. Um, if you're still looking at elements as to where it might move forward. Yes, we, we're engaging with all stakeholders and, and, and the legal um, sector as well as we move forward through this bill. Thank you, Thank you very much for that. Thank you. Thank you. And over to Oliver Mundell. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Convener. Um, I wanted to ask about the Guarantee Fund. Um, in relation to the proposed powers for Ministers uh, for the Fund at Schedule 1, Paragraph 6, uh, the Law Society suggested that the consultation requirement should be paired with a requirement to publish the outcome of that consultation. Does the Scottish Government have a view on that? Thank you, Mr Mundell. Um, having considered the feedback from stakeholders, we do intend to bring forward amendments at Stage which introduce a requirement for the Lord President's consent before any regulations are made using this provision and which narrow the scope so that it be used in response to the request of a regulator of the consumer panel. These provisions are necessarily brought to ensure the guarantee fund, which is established in now quite <coughs> aged legislation, continues to be able to adapt to changes to the way the solicitors operate. I don't know if any of my officials want to come in here. Of course, um, as the Guarantee Fund uh, relates to um, a key uh, provision in respect of ensuring that there's a mechanism to, to support consumers um, and there is a, 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 a public interest that consumers are protected in terms of legal services regulation, um, this measure is designed to ensure that there is a, a, a lever uh, to inform uh, uh, any uh, failures in the, the, the Climate Protection Fund. And as the Minister has, has, has pointed out, we're looking at amending that so that such changes could be introduced uh, following um, a, requ a, a request made by a regulator or the consumer panel uh, and for the, the, the Lord President to have a, 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 a for the Lord President's consent to be required before uh, this could, 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 be, could be brought forward. Thank you. Um, can I just ask again, just really for more clarity on, on, on how the Lord President's consent provision would work in practice? What, 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 would, that, what would that look like and how would stakeholders and, and Parliament really follow that process? I think um, Mr Mandel was still working through the detail um, on that moving forward, but if we will be taking on board any um, recommendations from this committee, um, if, if you want to make any recommendations in, re in relation to Schedule 1, Paragraph 6. You would recognise it's quite hard for the, the committee or for individuals in the committee to come to a view you know, on, on, on the scope of the, the, the this, this Lord President's consent provision, which is now going to run you know, through, a, through a substantive part of the bill without kind of knowing how it's going to work in practice what you know, what would the process what would the process look like and you know how would we how would we know what discussions had taken place around that how would stakeholders know you know if, if, if there were concerns or what proposals had you know are is, is part if it's be introduced to Parliament then go for the consent or are they going to go for consent first and then 
come to the Parliament? Are there going to be ministerial level discussions with the Lord President and uh, their office before before Parliament was about it? What, how, how is it going yes. to actually so work? There, so as the bill's been introduced, there have been ongoing discussions, as I've said, with stakeholders and the Lord President and the judiciary on this moving forward. We're still at stage one, so we've got a bit to go as we go through the parliamentary process of this bill. But as we move forward, we're happy to provide further detail. But at the moment, we're still working on the detail. You know, I think it's too fundamental to have got to this point in the process and still not not be able to give a kind of, you know, a relatively high level explanation of how the how the procedure would work. Um, I, I I don't. I will bring in my my officials, but I think as as since the bill's been introduced, I think we've shown a willingness and openness to work with the judiciary and stakeholders moving forward and consider amendments prior to the stage one. So no, I do not um, agree with you yourself there. Does any? Um, Jamie, do you want to come Thanks, in? Uh, thank you. Um, as the Minister has, has pointed out, um, you know, I would re 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 reiterate um, that the mechanism would be um, as it exists in, in existing, le existing legislation with regard to the Legal Services Act 2010. Um, that consent mechanism is a veto. Uh, uh, is at the start of the process. It would be in a statutory process whereby ministers would have to obtain that consent before they could bring forward regulations. Uh, but we're looking at the scope of that so that uh, that consent could only be uh, sought when a, a, a the consumer panel or a regulator makes a request to the Lord President, and the Lord President could perhaps have a, 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 the ability to m make a recommendation to Scottish ministers to bring forward uh, regulations. Uh, so that, 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 that is a kind of broad mechanism that, that we're looking at and which already exists in terms of existing uh, uh, statutes. You, you would recognise that this is a significant expansion of that. You know, what, what's in the the, the, the current statute you know, it, it, it is a kind of one-off incident, whereas this runs right through what's been proposed. You know, and is you know, the the, co the topics it covers, you know, the the, the range of provisions and, and their potential reach is, is is far wider. Do you think that would be fair? I mean, I, I, th th there are a range of mechanisms <laughs> in existing legislation that require the consent of the Lord President. In terms of the, the the 1990 Act, where the Association of Construction Attorneys uh, were given uh, 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 the ability to for rights of audience and rights of, for rights of litigation, in relation to the 2010 Legal Services Act, whereby um, the Law Society of Scotland were authorised to regulate alternative business structures. Um, so, as the the, the the senators of the Colleges of Justice set out in their response to the Lead Committee, um, there is an overarching role for the Lord President in terms of legal services regulation. Um, so, we view it appropriate uh, that that. Um, situation remains. Yeah, I, think I feel it's a bit un unfair to keep pushing uh, you know, an official, so I'll, I'll, I'll stop there. I'm quite happy. Thank you. Okay. Uh, thank you. And Bill Kidd. Thank you, Convener. Um, thank you for your responses so far, Minister. Can I just ask um, something um, in terms of making changes to regulatory functions? And um, in paragraph 23 of Schedule 2, um, which is a bit narrowed down, but there you go, provides that where a regulator um, has acted or failed to act in a way which has had or is likely to have an adverse impact on the observance of any of the regulatory objectives and the matter cannot be addressed adequately by the Scottish ministers taking any of the measures mentioned on the face of the bill. Uh, such as setting performance targets or imposing a financial penalty, then the Scottish ministers may make regulations at this point to change or remove some or all of the functions of the regulator, which sounds quite dramatic. Such regulations have additional requirements before they may be made, including sharing with consultees and laying in draft before the Scottish Parliament. So stakeholders who appeared before the committee uh, previously have suggested that Schedule 2 should be deleted in its entirety, given that they, are al that they are also calling for the deletion of Section 20 to which Schedule 2 relates. Now, do you have any further reflections on the matter um, in mind of this? Yes, thank you, Mr Kidd. Uh the power allows for changes to the regulator's, regulator's function. 
where that relates to a regulator whose regulatory scheme was approved by the virtue of the 1990 Act or for future regulators who achieve accreditation by virtue of the bill, this may, may be done via direction. This is not considered possible for existing regulators who regulatory functions are set out in primary legislation, for example, the Law Society or the faculty, and it's considered in such a case that regulators are the most appropriate way to make changes. By way of an example, it's considered that the Law Society has, if it was considered that the Law Society had failed to properly regulate conveyancing or executory practitioners, that function could be used. Uh, where this power also could be used, this power is designed to be applied when a Category 1 or a Category 2 regulator has not observed the regulatory uh, objectives. As we're moving forward and having considered the feedback from stakeholders, we do intend to bring forward amendments at stage two to transfer the responsibilities at section 19 to 20 to the Lord President. Therefore, we're also giving consideration to amending this section so that regulations may only be brought forward at the recommendation of the Lord President. As an additional safeguard, we're also cons um, giving consideration to the consent of the Lord President to any draft regulations before they can be laid to Parliament. I have listened very carefully to the concerns from the legal sector and even the Esther Robertson, who was at your um, committee last week or the week before, where she, even though she wanted the independent regulator, she did not feel it was appropriate to have any ministerial government interference, and I'm listening carefully, and this is why we are considering these amendments. Okay, so on that basis then, although um, the Scottish government ministers would be taking an intervention, it would be to redirect the powers to the Lord President? Is that the detail now, and okay. in discussions with them. Right, well, okay. Well, thank you for that. Okay, thank you. Um, and, Minister... Um, obviously, uh, there are 21 delegated powers uh, in the bill as introduced, and we have certainly focused our questions upon the, uh, on nine of them. Uh, these are nine which certainly have uh, focused the, the minds and attentions of stakeholders um, within the, the sector. However, the committee will be reporting on all of the de delegated powers in the bill to the lead committee to help inform its stage one considerations. And as you'll be aware uh, of the additional written submission uh, from the Law Society, uh, giving additional views on some of the other delegated powers in the Bill. Uh, are there any final comments that you would uh, wish to make on any of the other delegated powers contained in the Bill? The committee, just thank um, Convener, and I'd just like to thank the Committee for their time and look forward to receiving your report. Okay, okay, thank you. And Jeremy Buff. Just reflecting this whole evidence, uh, Minister, I, I wonder, I'm obviously we are trying to future-proof a bill which will probably last for, you know, several decades. Are you confident that this bill, not in regard to your government or even the next government, but future governments, gives too much power to ministers which could be misused in the wrong hands? Or are you confident the safeguards are there? I think, um, no, I am confident because you'll see that we are trying to remove the minister, the role of ministers from the bill and assign it so it, it, there will be no government interference. So I am confident moving forward through the amendments that I've talked about today. Okay, thank you. Okay, uh, colleagues, have any other questions? I've got one, but anyone else? No, okay. Uh, minister, um, certainly it's, uh, I mean, this isn't, Specific a question really for the, for the, the committee as such. Uh, but, Minister, you're aware of the, the McClure's solicitors uh, situation. I'm quite sure that colleagues from uh, across the, the Parliament will have received emails from, in, uh, from constituents about this uh, also. Uh, clearly, uh, there's a lot of unhappy individuals uh, across the country and elsewhere within, uh, within the UK. Now, some of the issues that have been raised uh, actually involve either trust and succession, but others uh, involve the legal services. Obviously, two bills that this committee uh, certainly uh, are looking at. Uh, would you be content to meet me to discuss concerns raised uh, by constituents um, with a view to potential amendments to uh, either of the bills going forward? Thank you, Convener. Um, yes, this has been raised with myself. As you know, it's not possible for Scottish ministers or the Scottish Government to intervene or comment on an individual legal matter, but I'm happy to meet the Convener to discuss sure. this. Uh, no, thank you for that, because um, I think certainly just in, regarding the, the Law Society submission uh, that came in, the second one, um, I think um, quite helpfully actually in their submission, they referenced sections 39, 
subsection 6, section 40, subsection 3, and section 45, subsection 2, which I think uh, certainly could uh, potentially be part of the uh, discussion. I'm happy to make with yourself. Okay. Thank you very much, that Minister. Um, with that, if there are no uh, other questions, can I thank the Minister and her officials for their evidence this morning. Uh, the committee may follow up by a letter uh, with any additional questions stemming uh, from the meeting. And with that, thank you very much, and I will suspend the uh, session to allow witnesses to leave the room. Thank you. And our agenda item number three, we are considering three instruments subject to the affirmative procedure. An issue has been raised on one of these instruments, which is the draft retained EU law, Revocation and Reform Act 2023, Consequential Amendments, Scotland, Regulations 2023. The instrument is made under section 19.1 of the retained EU law, Revocation and Reform Act 2023, which enables the Scottish ministers to make any provision they consider appropriate in consequence of that Act. The instrument updates various pieces of primary and secondary legislation to replace the terminology of, and I quote, retained EU law, and associated expressions with, and I quote, assimilated law, and associated expressions. In correspondence with the Scottish Government, which has been published online, alongside the agenda for this meeting, the Committee queried paragraph 3 of Schedule 1, of the instrument which would amend the Freedom of Information the Scotland Act 20, sorry, 2002 by changing EU obligation to assimilated obligation in sections 26 and 45. In particular, the committee noted that these references to EU obligation appear not to have been updated previously to retained EU obligation and asked why the Scottish Government considered that the power in section 19 of the 2023 Act enabled this amendment to be made. In its response, the Scottish Government confirmed that the references to EU obligation in these sections have not been updated to retained EU obligation. The Scottish Government advised that this change uh, could have been made following enactment of the European Union Withdrawal Act 2018, but it did not say why this wasn't done. The Scottish Government considers these amendments to be consequential, in particular on the establishment by the 2023 Act of Assimilated Obligation as a defined term within the body of assimilated law, including for the purposes of statutory interpretation. The instrument in front of us today now seeks to change these references straight from EU obligation to assimilated obligation, skipping the step of updating them to retained EU obligation. The committee notes that the term EU obligation is no longer a defined term. It appears to the committee that the provision in question may be addressing a failure to have updated these sections in consequence of the EU Withdrawal Act of 2018, rather than making provision that is properly in consequence of the 2023 Act. As such, it considers there is room for doubt that the provision in question is envisaged by and within the limits of the enabling power. Therefore, there appears to be a doubt whether it is intra Does the committee wish to draw the instrument to the attention of the Parliament on reporting ground E, in that there appears to be a doubt whether paragraph 3 of Schedule 1 is intra yes. 
Also under the agenda item, no points have been raised on the draft colleges further. Sorry, <coughs> excuse me. The draft colleges of further education and regional strategic bodies membership of boards Scotland Order 2023 and the draft Quality Meet Scotland Amendment Order 2023. Is the committee content with these instruments? Yep. Under agenda item number four, we're considering two instruments subject to the negative procedure. No points have been raised on SSIs 2023, 300 and 308. Is the committee content with these instruments? Yep. Thank you. And that concludes the public part of today's meeting. And I now move the committee into private.